Thank you for joining me on another episode of Profiles. This program allows me to take time each month to highlight the unsung people, programs, and events that make the 12th District so special. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do. On today's show, we will be joined by Dr. Donna Curtin. Donna is the Executive Director of the Pilgrim Society and the Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth. Donna is a lifelong advocate of public history and historic preservation. She gained a passion for public history while working as a role player at the Plymouth Plantation. And since then, she is working in numerous roles, preserving and communicating the storied history of America's hometown. Donna is a resident of Plymouth and serves as an elected town meeting member. Donna, it's so good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. It's a delight to be on Profiles, and I, I feel like such a, a District 12 uh, girl having grown up in Pembroke and, and having uh, lived and worked in, in Plymouth now for quite a few decades. Wow. So I didn't know you lived in Pembroke. You grew up in Pembroke. See, I learned something every day. I, yes, I grew up on the South Shore. I, I love this region. I love this part of the country. And uh, this is where, these are my roots right here. Oh, that's great. So as I mentioned, you are a lifelong advocate of public history and historic preservation. How did you first become this passion? How did you develop this passion for this? Well, I think part of that comes from being from this remarkable region that you know, we live and work in and uh, love and people love to visit it. Every step of the way, there is uh, some trace of a, a very uh, deep past. You know, obviously we can uh, trace that past back to uh, very ancient indigenous cultures that uh, lived here in this beautiful part of the world. And uh, then with the, you know, from the work that I do now at Pilgrim Hall Museum, the arrival of the Mayflower Pilgrims in the 17th century and the whole, uh, uh, layers and layers of uh, many arrivals of other immigrants to this region. You know, you can't walk outside your door without encountering history. So I took an interest at a very early age. I think it even happened in my grandparents' old barn. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so funny. They had an old barn, and I used to go exploring in there and see all these old things kicking around, old farm equipment. There was a, uh, there was actually a, um, an old um, hoop skirt <laughs> that women used to wear in the 19th century that, uh, you know, we'd play with as kids. What are these odd old things? And that really sparked my interest in learning about the place that I lived in. And I think that's so valuable to families that are here today to find out about the place where they live, where they're raising their children and uh, what happened here in the past. I agree. I agree. You know, I'm really curious. I did not know this either, that you worked as an interpreter at, at the Plymouth Patuxent, now the Living Museum. So Tell me a little bit about that. I want to know like the questions people asked and, and the character that you had to portray. Did you take that home with you? I mean, there's so many. I'm so interested in that part of your life. Well, it was a wonderful introduction to history. And I, I worked there first as a teenager. This was back when uh, Plymouth Patuxent was Plymouth Plantation. So this was quite quite a few years ago in the in the early days of, of the costume reenactment program that they were developing. Um, and it was just so exciting to, you know, put on these clothes and work on your accent and greet the visitors. And uh, um, I was assigned to be a, a, a young girl who had come on, on one of the later ships to the colony, Mary Warren. Uh, and, and she was a young woman who, who got married about the, the uh, time that the village portrayed at that time. So um, I found out actually years later in 2020 that I'm a direct descendant from the person that I was portraying in costume and talking to visitors about. Oh, my uh, and uh, that was just astonishing to me because I, you know, my family heritage was um, we always identified with the Italian side of the family <laughs> and uh, didn't really even realize that our English roots were quite so deep uh, as that. Um, but people would ask wonderful questions. You know, there's a lot of curiosity about real life experiences, you know, and that's one of the great benefits we have of this region is that here in New England, 
those settlers that came here over the years were literate and they kept records, uh, you know, the court records that you can find uh, on public display at our registry of deeds, um, records that are housed at places like Pilgrim Hall Museum, uh, really give us tremendous insight into the daily lives and experiences of the people that lived here. And I find that's what the public really loves to connect with. They, they, they want to know, you know, what did people go through? Uh, sometimes we like to know what people thought and what they felt, and those can be harder things to determine from the records that we have. But it is, it is, you know, the, the, the truth of the past is that it is real experience that people have gone through, and how do we recover those stories and voices? And obviously, to recover them uh, to, to represent all those who lived here. So uh, much of the work that we've been doing in recent years is trying to recover the voices of people who have been hidden and obscured over time, including in this area, very particularly indigenous uh, histories. Yes, yes. I have to say the field trips, I have four children. So I've been to Whitman with the Plymouth Plantation many, many times. It was the most favorite field trip of all the students, especially when they were younger. Second grade was the best because they had the most amazing questions you didn't realize that you never knew what they were thinking and then they would come out with this amazing question I'd be like wow it's, it does start at a young age I think being interested in history starts at a very young age especially like the young women that we have now so the young women that I've met a lot of young women since I've been in this role um, high school middle school high school and college level and they're so interested in the women in their past what can you tell us about the history of women in Plymouth uh, well, we actually at Pilgrim Hall Museum uh, did a wonderful exhibition called Pathfounders, Women yes. of Plymouth, because we felt, just as you're describing, that the history of women is really important, both as a way to have um, leadership models for women of young women and girls of today, but also because you really don't understand the history of any community if you're not looking at the participation of everybody in it. Women shaped uh, the colonial world in profound ways that for many generations, historians weren't really that interested in looking at. So we went back and uh, again, we always try at Pilgrim Hall Museum to be very balanced in our approach to the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make certain we are uh, looking as deeply at Wampanoag histories as we are at the English colonial histories and the histories of uh, the Mayflower pilgrims. And um, we, we work with partners um, in indigenous communities. Um, one of our trustees is a wonderful uh, Wampanoag educator and historian, Linda Coombs. And mm -hmm. she actually worked with us in some of the content for that exhibition. Uh, but, but we went in and, and found that there were very different patterns of how women's lives were uh, recognized and uh, the types of um, roles that they were courted uh, in Wampanoag society as opposed to colonial society. And in Wampanoag society, women often had leadership roles um, that didn't emerge in English culture, in Western culture, until very much later. I mean, we still we still uh, look to advance and support women's leadership even today, many yeah. centuries later, because that was not part of that that earlier tradition. So I think those kinds of bringing out those kinds of experiences and stories, and also just the kinds of hardships um, that that women had to to face. Um, when we look, for example, at the Mayflower Pilgrims in their first winter in Plymouth, um, it's interesting to me, um, you know, it was a very difficult time. There was sickness and half of the colony died before mm. the spring. But the mortality rate among the adult women was much, much higher. And why was that the case? Uh, so we ask sometimes our visitors as they're, you know, and, and uh, kids too, uh, we talk about some of the children that lived through that uh, period of time and um, how they made it through. Um, but one of the reasons uh, we feel that the adult women um, really suffered more greatly is because they were the caretakers for their right. family. And they were really what we would today consider a frontline worker mm -hmm. um, out there tending to the sick and exposing themselves to greater danger and risk. Um, and we've also looked um, during that first winter at the experience of some of the teenage girls who were in the colony at the time. And what a remarkable story. We don't think about that, that there was a whole group of young girls who lost both their parents and had to continue in this entirely new place on their own. Um, and uh, many of those girls went on to have marry and have large families. And there are literally millions and millions of descendants from them today. So there's, there's a lot of power in thinking of 
what one individual life can impact going down the line. There really is. And the last time I was visiting the museum, which is one of my favorite places, I've told you that before, there was a video that I watched and the young girl that portrayed one of the young women back then is works in your gift shop. <laughs> yes, we had two wonderful local high school students who are not, you know, trained actors, although they've done some high school acting and uh, they portrayed in these wonderful series of, of videos that we did. Um, two of the two of the Mayflower passengers, and uh, they did a fantastic job. And they also both of them uh, ended up coming and working uh, part time uh, for us uh, in our gift shop over the summer as a summer job. So that was really terrific. We you know love trying to bring families and younger people into our museum. Um, it really uh, is important to us to connect with our community and to connect with families because we want these stories to be um, not only engaged and acknowledged, but also, you know, we want people to pass down their excitement for learning in this area. Can you tell our viewers, so, you know, it's a little, I think it's a little secret sometimes. A lot of people don't know about the Pilgrim Museum and it is such a remarkable place, like I said before. Can you tell our viewers why it's a must see, why they must go and what is so special? And what drove you to be there and what makes it so special for you? Uh, it is such an honor for me to be the executive director of the oldest continuously operating public museum in the entire country. You know, the collection at Pilgrim Home Museum is astonishing. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we're planning a new exhibit right now, and I just can't tell you how excited I am. It actually is called Real Mythic, and it's looking at both the real experiences of people in the early colony, both Wampanoag and English, uh, but also at some of the myths that have, have emerged as mm. You know, history is a little bit like a game of telephone. The, you know, information can get uh, changed and altered and, and become other than fact over time. It becomes myth, it becomes a legend. And so we're trying to you know, pull those things apart a little bit. Uh, but Pilgrim Hall Museum has been at the gateway of Plymouth, Historic Plymouth Center for, uh, you know, 200 years. And um, it is a wonderful granite historic building. And when you go inside, there's beautiful modern exhibitions, as well as in the older part of the museum, there's just such grandeur and these monumental artworks and paintings and sculptures, in addition to the historical artifacts, some of which are among the rarest and oldest um, American colonial artifacts in the entire country, things that actually came on the Mayflower. And they're very intimate, they're very personal. Um, so to be, to be the person who is responsible for a collection of that level of significance is just, it's a truly a career pinnacle and um, a personal sort of uh, dream come true for me because I've always valued these artifacts of the past that inform us about where we've come from. Um, and uh, it, it's just, a, it's a great honor and privilege. So we're, we're right in downtown Plymouth, we're on Court Street. We're closed for the winter season, um, be, partly because things are a little different still in our pandemic times, but we're going to be reopening in April and we're free to Plymouth residents, but we are always uh, very happy to welcome our friends and families who live here on the South Shore uh, to come and see the museum. That's wonderful. I did not know you were close to the winter season, so I'm glad that you let everyone know that. But I have to talk about my, this passion that is there at the tapestries. And every time that I've come to visit, there's been more and more. And I'm just so mesmerized by the detail and the stories behind it and the people that learned how to do it. So could you tell our, our viewers about that? We started this project. This was uh, one of our big uh, 2020 400th anniversary uh, efforts. We wanted to try to tell the story of Plymouth Colony in a new way. And the idea came up, well, let's do a historical embroidery. Yeah. So we are working with an absolutely amazing and remarkable artist, Elizabeth Creeden of Plymouth. And she is a, a master embroiderer. And she has created this like medieval workshop in her studio <laughs> where she is making these enormous embroidered mm. panels. Each one is six feet long and there's going to be uh, 20 of them when we're all done. So we're going to have 120 feet of just beautiful hand-stitched needlework. 
Um, they're about halfway through the series. They've been stitching right through, even, even through the quarantine and, uh, you know, stitching and design on this project has continued. And um, they're magnificent. They show um, what Plymouth was like when it was the Wampanoag village of mm. Patuxet long before the arrival of Europeans. And they show all of the experiences of the uh, English separatists, um, you know, forming their, their uh, religious congregation and living in exile in Holland and crossing on the Mayflower and what activities occurred when they uh, came here to the early colony and encountered the uh, native people here. So um, the last uh, scene is going to be of the, of the first Thanksgiving. And all of this has been done with the high level of sensitivity and in the engagement of um, indigenous advis as advisors among our historical team. So we're making certain that it's a inclusive retelling uh, a very powerful retelling, and but the artistry is oh my astonishing, gosh. and that's that's you know I remember when we were in the museum together looking at that, Kathy, and it's just it's absolutely stunning. And each piece is is just the detail of each piece. You think that you're seeing the most amazing thing, and then you just move a little bit, and it's just it's fascinating. I can't urge everyone enough when they open in April. You must, must see that. You, you will never see anything like that again. And all the hands that went into that and the work and the just, and you said they did them upside down too. When they were doing the needlework, they were doing it upside down. Yeah, just amazing. When they stitch the panels, they, they have to be on both sides of the, the linen. Um, they're, they're large pieces so that the, the stitchers are actually physically reaching out to stitch, you know, many inches away from where they are. This isn't like you're just sitting there with your little, you know, sampler in your hand and doing it. This is this is pretty monumental work. Um, and so some of them have to stitch upside down. I don't know how they do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either, but I, it's just fascinating to me and I cannot wait to view it again and see. I'm sure there's been more done since the last time I've been there as well, so. Oh yes, oh. They're doing a night scene right now. The, the the pilgrims are trying to uh, flee. They you know they're trying to flee England, and uh, at the time they they weren't allowed to leave the country without official permission, and they they didn't have it. So they were they were trying to leave um, so they could set up their own congregation in, in Holland, and uh, they get captured, and some of them are taken to prison, and it's at night. So the whole, there's like moonlight on the water and, you know, everything is in shades of blue and gray and it is just astonishing. Oh, I can't wait to see it. I cannot wait to see it. So tell me, what do you see for the museum's future? What are some of the projects you'd like to see done or um, the exhibits that you'd like to see that we could bring here to Plymouth? Well, you know, we're at such an interesting point in our cultural community right now. You know, the last two years, you know, has been a time of trying to surmount some pretty steep challenges, but it's also been an opportunity for organizations like ours to really think about where are we going and where do we want to be? You know, time for some reflection, time for new directions. Um, and at Pilgrim Hall, this has been uh, somewhat uh, given some more impetus by the fact that on the top of our beautiful historic museum building is a skylight that was installed in 1914 and it has decided wow. it has reached the end of its lifespan. <laughs> and, um, you know, during, during the uh, exigencies of the last couple of years, we've realized that um, this has to be replaced. And so it's time for some big new thinking about um, doing some interior redesign of our wonderful museum, since we are going to have to literally take off the roof of our wonderful hall filled with its, massive artworks and all that's going to have to be protected and uh, worked on and stored. So, so while we're doing that significant work and right now we're working to, to raise funds so we can move forward with this very large scale project to save our historic building and preserve these amazing and remarkable American treasures. Um, we are going to do some interior improvements and uh, inside the museum so that um, our exhibits, which are fantastic and in depth can can really be brought into the 21st century. So when people walk in, I think the awe factor that this historic place has always carried is going to be exponentially uh, increased. Um, and we'll do that through lighting and through new exhibition design, um, as well as through addressing some of the building needs. Oh, so man. lots of big stuff coming lots down the pipe. Lots of big <laughs> stuff, Donna, lots of big stuff. If someone wanted to help with that, you said you're gonna raise funds. If someone wanted to help, how could they do that? 
Oh, they can reach out to us at any time. They can uh, uh, contact me, director at pilgrimhall.org. They can go on to our website and keep an eye out for news on social media. We're just in the planning stages of, of this major effort going forward. So, um, you know, there isn't necessarily going to be all those details that are uh, out there available at the moment, but it will be coming along very soon. Good, good. And you'll have to shut down for a bit, I'm assuming, when that happens. We're going to try to keep part of our museum open. So oh. we want to have the doors open to the public. We have missed seeing people at our museum over these last two years. And one of the things we're really looking forward to, we won't be doing any of this building work this season. And we are really looking forward to having uh, more visitation at the museum in 2022. So this spring and summer and fall, if you live in this area and you have not visited, or even if you have visited before, you really should be planning a trip to see one of the most remarkable institutions of culture in our region. And I agree. And I think we should end there because I could ask about more history. I could listen to your stories forever. I tell you that I tell, go home to my family and I said, oh, I just listened to the best. You're the best storyteller. It's just, you bring everyone in and I really appreciate it. So I urge everyone when they open in April and you see Dr. Curtin, please ask her all the questions that you have because she's going to give you the best answers and you're going to love them and you're going to become more involved. So if you can become more involved with the Pilgrim Museum, it is an amazing place. And I want to thank Dr. Curtin for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Representative Lenatra, and for the support you have given to Pilgrim Hall Museum and to all of our cultural community in our region. We truly appreciate all you do for us. Oh, thank you, Donna, and I appreciate everything you do for Plymouth. We will be right back with our State House Minute. On each episode of Profiles, I like to take a minute to take my constituents out of the 12th Plymouth District and provide a quick update of what is going on up on Beacon Hill. On February 9th, Governor Baker and Commissioner Jeff Riley of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education announced that the statewide mask mandate currently in effect in school settings will expire on February 28th and will not be renewed. In a memo to school officials across the Commonwealth, Commissioner Riley stated that the current COVID-19 data, as well as the high vaccination rates and the widespread availability of COVID-19 testing for school personnel and students. While the COVID-19 pandemic is not over, and I encourage everyone to get vaccinated and boosted to protect themselves and their loved ones if they have not already done so. I am happy to see the numbers dropping and happy to see our students get back to some, some semblance of normalcy in the classroom. I want to thank Dr. Curtin for joining us today and for her outstanding work in helping to preserve and exhibit the rich history of Plymouth has to offer. Under her leadership, Pilgrim Hall Museum is truly a must-see destination for residents and tourists alike, and I am so appreciative of all the hard work she has put in to creating such an incredible space. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us next month for Profiles with myself, Kathy Lenatra.